Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I am Tigris Osborne. I am the chair of the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, and you are here with us today for the NAFA webinar series. And in this special Fat Liberation Month edition, um, we are joined by Artie from Curves Become Her. Hi, Artie. Hi. I'm going to make just a few announcements before I introduce Artie more formally and get started with them. Um, thank you for being with us. Happy Fat Liberation Month. We are in late May and we are way into Fat Liberation Month, almost at the grand finale of Fat Liberation Month, which happens this weekend. Um, in addition to today's webinar, we do have one more educational webinar for you coming from uh, Brandy, we'll be joined by Brandy Senziak from FLAIR, which is the Fat Legal Advocacy Rights Education Project. And uh, Brandy will be talking about fat justice. And then um, we have some fun activities to wrap up the month this weekend. On Saturday, we have our Fat Trivia Challenge, which invites you to come with the team or be assigned to a team. If you register as an individual, you can meet some new friends. And we've got about 25 questions for you that'll take you through um, a bunch of really fun fat activism history. And um, some of them are questions that you would have learned the answers to if you've been with us this month. So even if you think you don't know a lot of fat trivia, you should sign up and play the game. And we also um, on Saturday have a virtual mixer. Our fat trivia game is hosted by Patrick Rostock. Our, um, our fat, uh, fat Liberation Month virtual mixer is hosted by Emma Poundcake, and it will be DJed by DJ Dazzler. Um, who is way more of a whiz than I am at the sound stuff. So if you were with us when the last time we had a DJ video, DJ Dazzler is joining us live and she's a master at these things. So we will have live music for you, some prizes to give away from friends in fat community. And we can't wait to see you to wrap up the month with you on Saturday. Um, so please go to nafa.org and look at the Fat Liberation Month tab um, and sign up for these events. That's how you get the Zoom link and we hope to see you there. Um, and I think um, anything else you want to know about NAFA, you can learn at our website. There's a great blog there. There's information about um, our grants program. There's information about our board. There's all kinds of uh, fun stuff at NAFA.org, N-A-A-F-A.org. And I just also want to tell you that we are joined today by Ryan and Bilkis from Pro Bono ASL. We thank them for their work today. And um, now I'm going to introduce Artie. Artie Olivia Dubay is a former mental health therapist who exists as Curves Become Her across social media platforms. Over the past 10 years, they have worked in plus size fashion, fat activism, race and gender politics. As a fat non-binary South Asian born in Southeast Asia, they have worked with local, regional, and international publications to speak upon fat liberation and existing as a minority voice. Ladies and gentlemen and friends of all gens, welcome Artie to the NAFA webinar series. Hi Artie. Hi. It's so good to have you. I know it's, y'all Artie is joining us at almost one o'clock in the morning, their time. Um, and we are super appreciative of you accommodating us in that way. Um, thank That's you for okay. <laughs> so um, tell us what you've been doing to celebrate Fat Liberation Month. Um, well, <clears throat> I feel like it's Fat Liberation Month every, uh, you know, every month for me. You know, I'm always celebrating people um, sharing snippets of, you know, fat activism and fat folks in my stories and highlighting things that are happening. So, yeah, I've just been, I guess, upping the ante a bit on that. And um, sharing a lot more articles. Uh, I talked a little about it. Um, but it's also been a really, really busy time because Singapore has gone into a STEMI kind of lockdown. So I did get a little distracted, you know. But yeah, well, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Uh, just a little distracted by a full lockdown in the place where you live. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can give you some, some leeway for that. Yeah, yeah. But um, aside from that, yeah. So... So for folks who are with us who don't know 
anything about life in Singapore. What do we need to know to sort of contextualize your work? Like, what does it mean to be a fat, um, uh, gender non-conforming person in Singapore? Singapore is a multinational, multi-racial country. It involves, uh, it has four races, the Chinese who are the majority race. And as a result, um, they are the default beauty standard. Um, and, you know, a lot of our growing up years, you know, there was a fair bit of peer pressure to kind of adhere to a certain body type, to a certain to certain beauty standards um, while growing up and fairly fat phobic. Um, Asians are very, very in your face with things like uh, body shaming. And there really isn't much consideration for things like personal space. And it's considered okay to greet each other by saying, hey, hi, I've not seen you in a bit you've lost weight or you've gained weight. And it's like the first thing people kind of greet themselves with. And um, yeah, uh, there is a fair bit of fat phobia here for sure. Um, so it's interesting because I exist as a South Asian, you know, and so uh, culturally and even, you know, genetically, my, my mother is plus sized, my grandmother is plus sized. And so, you know, I, I was, I always lent, lean towards being plus sized and um you know of course that meant that you know it was difficult in the dating pool it was difficult um just in general you know uh trying to find um acceptance on the whole and a sense of belonging so yeah um it's a very small <laughs> fat positive community we have here we're very loud but you know it's still small and it's growing yeah, I was going to say, it seems like you're very, I mean, I know Singapore's fat positive community through you, right? So yeah. I, I know you and I see some of your other friends participating when you are in, you know, other kinds of workshops or interviews, or I see them participating on your social media. So, so okay. it, seems loud, it seems loud to me because I, I see this concentration of it through you. Um, right. Do you think it's loud um, to the other people in your country? I I think it is getting there. Um, when I first started out about 10 years ago, people were really not that interested. I mean, there was a very small minority who, you know, even bothered to check out my blog and wanted to find out what I was doing and what this was all about. But, you know, of course, when body positivity began to trend, then um, came a very mixed bag of like, people who were like, so what are you trying to promote? And also, oh, okay. So she's trying to, you know, make sure that, you know, bigger bodies are considered more acceptable, that they are less marginalized and stuff like that. So I think I've really seen a change since like, I don't know, 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I think last year I really got people's attention I guess because of the lockdowns so a lot of us were you know glued to our phones on our laptops and right. um yeah and that's where I got a bigger local base and it's been interesting because you know um it's been interesting to have people of different sizes different kinds of diversities have these conversations with me and for me to know that you know there's always been an undercurrent but people have been too afraid to talk about it, right? Because the the overwhelming thing is the fat phobia and the hate. Right. So they don't want to be, you know, part of the dissent, so to speak. Right, because be, right, it can be scary to go against the grain of whatever is great. Yeah. Um, so was there a particular moment or incident that made you start your blog or like tell us the story of how you became, how you went from Already mental health therapist to already a fashion blogger and body positive activist. I, I love comics, so I call this my origin story. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, having struggled with eating disorders for the bulk of my um, pre uh, preteen years, my teenagers, my adolescence, and well into my early adulthood. Um, I think, you know, there just came to came a point where I had to address the fact that I just wasn't living a life with, 
you know, much um, joy. I wasn't um, really allowing myself to heal in ways that I should have healed. And so this was part, um, I was curious because blogs were a really big thing and I've been blogging before and I thought plus size fashion was going to be so fun. And I really wanted to give it a try because I mean, ever since Instagram started and I saw bodies like Gabby Fresh, I just thought, oh my God, you know, this whole new world has opened for me. And um, I, I got really, really intrigued and inspired. And at the same time, um, I also wanted to see how this would help me evolve in terms of um, my mental health um, with my eating disorders and um, just overall healing. And so, yeah, it was one <laughs> stormy night. I was watching Death Becomes Her and I was registering my blog and I'm like, why not? Curse Become Her. I Let's do always, this. I have always assumed that there was a connection between... Yeah. Um, you know, between that movie title and your blog, but I, yeah. I'd never heard the specific. Um, and for for people who don't know that movie, there's a there's a really there's some interesting scenes around body stuff. Yes. Do you want to talk about any of those? Yes, and that's why I picked it because it was such a satirical view on you know the fountain of youth, on our bodies, on um, looking forever flawless, and I just. I, you know, like with Isabella Johnny, was it Isabella Johnny? No, it was the other one. But um, yeah, and I just thought it was so fitting for me to have Curves become her as kind of like a screw you, <laughs> screw beauty standards and, you know, let's just uh, change the narrative. So let's talk a little bit about those early days on social media, you know, because you started your blog and then you had this social media presence and you were inspired by other um, people on social media. There's a there's an ongoing dialogue right now that's been um, brought into the mainstream I, by Lizzo talking about it yeah. uh, related related to how the body positive movement in the early days of social media really had a backbone of black and brown women and femmes and disabled women and femmes and that the, the landscape has changed. Can you talk about how the landscape has changed and what your impressions are about that? It's changed completely. Um, I, I, you know, I was so inspired by black and brown creators at that time, and they were the primary reason that I, a person of color, felt brave and felt inspired enough to take those steps. You know, um, it was the representation that I saw. And so it was it was really, really fun to be part of that crowd. We were like, like I told Ivy, you know, it was like a gateway to this world. And then we moved on to different paths, you mm -hmm. know. People started blogs, people play with fashion, some became influencers, some became activists, and so on and so forth. And that, I feel, was like a really, really good time. And I appreciate the friends that I made during that time mm -hmm. and who really understood the meaning behind body positivity and not what it is today. And and Ivy, I should say, is Ivy Felicia from Fat Women yes. of Color. Um, and they do uh, a web series called Friday Fat Chat, which you should check out on their YouTube channel. It's Fat Women of Color on YouTube. Um, and, uh, and Artie had an episode fairly recently, and so did I. And there's a bunch of really amazing women and femmes, uh, black and brown women and femmes who um, have been featured on that show. And, um, and who are some of the other people? You mentioned Ivy from Fat Women of Color. You mentioned Gabby Fresh. Who were some uh, of the other people that, were, that you feel need to be um, acknowledged. I, I know it might not be an exhaustive list, so please don't feel yeah. worried about <laughs> okay. that, but, but just, you know, some of the, for me, like for me, Essie Golden, um, oh, and yes. those, golden, those golden pool parties, um, the, uh, you know, Sonia Renee Taylor, like there, there's a, a long list. Yeah. There Who is a really long list. For you? Yeah. So definitely for me, Sonia Renee Taylor, Essie Golden, Saucy West, um, Simone Mariposa, um we have um let's see who else my friend Ratna uh she she goes by the account Sapphire Splendor she is in Malaysia very very avid fat activist and then we've got um wow there are so many um 
there are just so many voices out there that are just not brought to the forefront that we just keep seeing the same old faces and it's just i don't know i i just feel like a movement should you know involve the lot involve a lot more voices than just the same old voices and and we should say explicitly that some of that change has been that smaller sized able-bodied and right. white women have gone to the forefront because right. they've been able to develop larger followings just because yeah. they are closer to the beauty norm mm. um and um and so so yeah, so I just, uh, I asked Artie to name a few people because I want to encourage you to find those folks. If you've been around yeah. NAFA, you should already know Saucy West. Saucy is a longtime friend of NAFA's um, and does a lot of stuff with us. But if you, um, but you know, some, and hopefully you already know some of those other folks, but if you don't check them out. Um, and so, um, so what do you, what kind of presence do you have now? For people who don't already follow you, um, you know, what's your following like? Who are the people that follow you? Um... It's an interesting mix now. Um, I remember when I first started the blog, my uh, initial goal was to reach out to, you know, plus size South Asians. Um, but uh, that wasn't really met until quite some time later. Um, and I think they had to build their base in India first. And then they looked beyond and they were like, oh, okay. So they do this stuff as well. Um, so it's a mix of my, my followers first were from the West, um, followed by um, South Asia. Yeah. And then, um, and then after that, Singapore. So it's a really, really interesting, diverse mix. And because I mix a lot of my plus size fashion with my activism and my activism has got, you know, quite a diverse reach. So it's a, it's a very interesting mix of people who come to learn all the different things that I talk about. And uh, I just, I just hope that, you know, I'm doing the work with educating and informing as best as I can. Yeah. What is, what is access to plus size fashion like in Singapore? Ooh, <laughs> it is a challenge. I mean, um, there is no such thing as getting invited to Fashion Week in Singapore. Um, like, you know, that was that was something I would have loved to have, but it just didn't happen. Ironically, it is only when I made a step back from plus size fashion and I went into fat activism that, uh, you know, I got the feature in Vogue Singapore this year. And then um, I got a few other features, which were surprising. Um, but reach is not much. There are people who are interested. Um, and I feel like, you know, it's beginning to really sprout this year. So I'm really hoping to gain traction this year with all of the, you know, collaborations that I get. And what kind of collaborations do you get? Because I, okay, so fashion folks who are listening and you, you didn't catch that, what Artie just said was Vogue Singapore. Um, Vogue. So um, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about, um, well, tell us a little bit about how you got that project and then tell us about some of the other fun fashion things that you've done over your 10 years. Um, there is a local magazine called Cleo Singapore and they were the first of, uh, magazine to feature me and it was really touching because this was back in 2014 and because I grew up reading this magazine and not really seeing bodies like mine being represented so I remember I wrote a piece for them and then they asked me to rope in two of my friends for a very fun swimsuit shoot which was a bikini shoot um although that did get a little controversial when instagram removed it and i got a little angry and um yeah so you know publications everywhere were asking me for a quote back in 2016 um but aside from that you know my friend rani she owns a plus size fashion store here so we do like you know uh yearly shoots together wearing our Indian outfits when Diwali is coming. Um, my husband is my photographer and he's been my photographer from the very beginning. I mean, he was the one who bought me the DSLR and he's like, 
let's do this. You have this dream and we'll get this done. And so um, I have like, you know, a couple of companies reaching out, like clothing companies asking for photo shoots and collaborations right now, podcasts who are interested in chatting with me about fashion and um, if there is such thing as sustainable plus size fashion, which is interesting. Um, and also extended sizing. Um, and yeah, so Vogue Singapore was a big, big surprise. But uh, all of my friends say, you know, it was a long time coming. So, okay, then <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's, do, uh, is it a little bit surreal? Like when you, because again, you, before you started doing this, you were a therapist. Yes. Right? Like, what was your life like? <laughs> I was such an introvert. I was such an introvert. And I was, um, you know, I didn't get out much. I still don't get out much. I didn't get out much. And I just kept to myself. And fashion was like something that I, you know, saw in magazines and I watched movies. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. I wish I could wear stuff like this. And, um, it took time for me to get used to even like the basics, like how do I pose? Um, how do I uh, feel comfortable? What if people are staring at me when I'm outside? And it's been so interesting to have Singaporean people staring at me while I'm posing in the bikini. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to really like get out of my head with that and challenge all of that internalized fat phobia that I had. Um, that. That yeah. was really, really cool. <laughs> and just, I feel like every outfit I wore, every every style that I tried, I just, I pushed myself further and further and I got braver and braver and I just kept, you know, breaking little boundaries for myself and little barriers for myself. I want to I, I wanna ask you something about what you just said about getting braver. There's a mm. narrative in activist oh, community. Oh, yes. <laughs> there's a narrative in activist community that we should not use the word brave to talk about things we do in fashion because it should just be the norm that we can do, wear the things and do the things that everybody else does. And mm. that, you know, it's, you know, it's not like I'm dashing into a house to a burning house to save a group of children. Like, it, you know, don't call me brave. And I, I've always been a little bit resistant to that narrative because I understand that it, it's a very personal narrative. It's not the most politicized piece of of fat liberation thinking. Um, oh. And yet there is an element of personal courage required oh, yeah. in doing the things that you haven't normally done. Yes. Is, so, um, I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, is it, how do you, how do you feel about what, how do you feel about other people calling you brave for doing it? It's a little bit different to call yourself brave for making the choice than it is when other people say that. That's true. Um, and uh, I always have to ask myself, is this person coming from a point of view of, oh, um, I could never, I could never if I was in your body. Or is it, um, you know, I aspire to one day do what you are doing. Mm -hmm. So there's always that fine line when, um, and yeah, you know, that question can be really tricky, but uh, that definitely is courage. And I, um, I don't talk about it all the time because I feel like, you know, it's a personal feat, I guess. Um, but, you know, as a fat, disabled South Asian woman to be out there who's married and who has really an, an orthodox family, orthodox in-laws. If what I'm doing is not brave, I don't know what is. Um, and so when people tell me that, you know, uh, the work that I'm doing is brave, I take it. I take it, but I, I tread lightly. I take it with a slight pinch of salt. I don't, um, you know, I don't uh, think of myself as some like, you know, uh, somebody on a pedestal or somebody who should be on a pedestal. I just see it as, yeah, you know, this is something I guess people cannot foresee themselves doing. And so they therefore see it as an act of bravery. Okay, that's fine. Um. I know that you hear from people about how wrong you are all the time. You mentioned Instagram. I want to go back to that. But also, um, anybody who's visibly fat and on the internet hears from people about how they're wrong in their body. 
But you mm-hmm. have some other elements of your identity that you hear from people about, and you have some, and there are some things that are, I think, um, culturally related around modesty and you being half naked on the internet, those kinds of things. <laughs> can you talk about, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, my block list is really long. <laughs> um, it's, it's challenging because you have, um, you know, the men, uh, of course, you know, uh, sending you messages for different kinds of reasons. And then you have the women and especially uh, <laughs> other fat women or even uh, South Asian women who kind of um, don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing and therefore feel the need to, you know, get angry with me and tell me things like, you know, I wonder what your mother would think and what I wonder what your mother-in-law would think to kind of, you know, give me a low blow. And I'm just like, well, you know, to have come to this point, I've dealt with quite a few low blows. So I've got a few, quite a few low blows under my belt. So, you know, I'm okay. Just come at me. I'm fine. Um, But I think it is when people feel like it is their business to constantly be in a fat person's um, existence online that really, really um, angers me sometimes. And so I occasionally make it a habit to sort of like display a comment someone has said and my response to it just to firstly show people of different sizes that Yes, this is something that happens to me and it happens to me on a daily basis, believe it. And also to sort of, I guess, um, give some support to my uh, friends who are fat and, you know, who maybe have been in such situations and just lack to come back. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh-huh. yes. Yeah. Yes. I remember the, the first time I talked online about the trolls that, and I, I've never been super trolled. I don't have a huge following, but I've never been super trolled the way some other folks uh, are. And, yeah. um, and uh, but what I've, you know, I've had enough of it to like know the landscape, right? And I remember the first time I talked about it on my personal Facebook and hearing from, from people who didn't know the landscape that yeah. it was, you know, if you didn't put yourself out there like that, you wouldn't be getting this. And it's that sort of like, and from people who would never say that about any other kind of feminist issue or women in their bodies or whatever, but that because I was fat, it was my fault for putting myself out there. It was, very, you know, and that, that sort of like all women get trolled on the, internet so you're not talking about anything different is how is it different i mean you know the the um paradox you know you you are hyper visible but at the same time uh people want to render you hyper invisible as well and uh you just cannot please everyone and uh it just comes down to that like people just don't like seeing fat happy confident people on the feed and if they do good for them but uh, most of the time it just you know occurs to them as like you know something that should not be promoted something that should not be um celebrated and stuff like that and the thing is um i sometimes feel like these trolls try to mooch off our um i guess you know mooch off the fact that we are having a moment you know, and we've been having a moment for quite some time now, you know, for about five, 10 years. And they're just not happy. They're so mad about it. They just stay yeah. so mad about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, it's remarkable sometimes that people make the time, not just have the time, but make the time to pursue the, the times that I have been trolled. It's just, it's usually been because I have used a fat positive hashtag that there are trolls who are committed to reviewing from time to time just to see who the new people are that they can harass. And like, yeah. oh, are you, that's your hobby? Like that's yeah. your actual hobby? Seriously. Wow. Seriously. Um, so what do you think, uh, you know, as somebody who does have a background, professional background in mental health, what do you think, do you think the internet is good for fat people's uh, mental health or bad for fat people's <laughs> mental health? <laughs> uh, it can be a challenging place for fat people, but you know, fat people have dealt with this in person, and I guess online it's a 
completely different level of trolling. So it depends on how thick your skin is. And it depends on the circles that you run in. And uh, I think, you know, safety in numbers is a good thing. So if you have allies with you and you have other fat friends, um, it really, really does make a difference because, I mean, trust me, I have my really, really bad days and I turn to my fat friends because, you know, there is nobody else who will get it. Nobody else who will understand the nuances, the things that we struggle with, you know, and the little insults that will get to us um, if we're having an off day. You know, and it's so human for you to feel that way. So I really, I try to pace myself. And um, especially like, you know, if I'm going through a particularly difficult time, like personally, you know, I do my best to sort of, you know, pick my battles mm -hmm. and um, maybe not be as... Um, visible online but like you know doing work um like offline and stuff like that but yeah um you also get some trolling that's not specifically related to being fat it's well it's mm. a combination of being fat and some of your other identities you want to talk about that i mean you take a pic you know it's, it's so easy to bully someone like me she's fat she's south asian and she's fat She's fat, she's South Asian, and she's not binary now. And before that, she was bisexual. I mean, where do we even begin? You know, it's just like, wow, it's it's amazing. There's so much to to pick on her for that. Um, queerness in Singapore is <laughs> uh, homosexuality homosexuality is still criminalized in Singapore. And um, we have an archaic section by the British that is still around and it really impacts the point of view. Um, so, you know, there is a sizable queer community here, but there is a lot of backlash and the government is not helping matters. And that just makes it really difficult to exist. You know, I was so afraid to come out as non-binary. Um, my bisexuality, I felt like, you know, uh, people were sort of okay with, but um, my non-binariness, I really ruffled a lot of feathers and, um, you know, putting my preferred pronouns and stuff like that, it really um, pissed people off. I think it's just, you know, because I stray so far from the norm, so, so, so far from the norm, I'm just this anomaly. And, you know, um, uh, people here, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't think they want to conform, but, you know, there is a sort of like group think, I guess, you know, because of how we've been brought up and the society we have and the cultures we have, and no one's really questioned it, no one's really challenged it. And if you do challenge it, you get into trouble for it. You can't protest in this country. You can't, you can't do much in this country without getting um, a letter from the police or from the government. So, you know, um, uh, trolls, trolls really have a, have a good time doing this and getting away with their anonymous profiles. And um, it can be challenging, you know, trying to point these things out and still defending your right to be here and be valid. Um, I just want to cue our live audience that if you all have questions for Artie, you can begin putting those questions in the chat. And it's uh, it's helpful, especially if y'all do start sharing um, resources or other things in the chat, that you actually put the word question at the beginning of your question. Um, so uh, so please feel welcome to start entering questions for Artie. Um, while they do that, I'll ask another question, Artie. Um, you know, we, when we were talking earlier about those folks who were really instrumental in the early days of body positivity, I should say also that a lot of those women and femmes were, were queer identified people. Yes. And did that visibility make a, an impact on you in the same way that the fat visibility did? Yes, a big difference. It was uh, very encouraging to see that um, they were unabashed about their sexuality and their uh, gender. And um, it was not something I had seen, to be honest, um, just like plus size fashion. And so it was really, really eye opening for me. And um, so instrumental, all of these um, all of these figures, all of these people, they have 
really um, changed my life, honestly. So many people that I am thankful for on the internet that I have never met and that I hope to meet someday and I just give them a hug and say, thank you for changing my life. Do you get that kind of message from your followers? I do. I do. Um, and, and because I'm an introvert and I struggle with imposter syndrome, um, uh, there's always this kind of like disbelief and, you know, I discredit, but I, I got my husband. My husband's always kind of like, yeah, no, don't do that. And I am working, you know, towards being more appreciative of these compliments, but generally compliments, you know, make me want to hide uh, like an ostrich in the ground. But uh, I'm, I'm doing much better with taking compliments. Yeah. And I'm so grateful. I mean, it's just so grateful for all the warmth. Like um, recently something personal happened and the amount of support I received was overwhelming. And I just, you know, it's like worldwide family. And I, it truly, truly, truly feels like a family to me. Worldwide. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, are so are there resources for masculine identified folks for visibility and body positivity? Who are we've been talking about the women and femme. What else is out there? Right. Um, let's see. So for masculine identifying, I think I I do have a number of folks that I follow. Um, but I would say that the numbers are lesser than the um, femme identifying for sure. Yeah, um, I think there is a lot of gray area like uh, in the non-binary community with people who identify more masculine. Um, I think um, body image could be one thing, you know, just and another thing could be just not having like choices out there as in like fashion choices, you know, or uh, judging yourself. Like when I cut my hair last year and um, I'm, I'm currently in the midst of thinking of shaving my head, you know, it's just uh, questioning all of that. And uh, yeah, I'm still looking for resources myself with that, to be honest. It's still like a very, very new thing for me. And um, there's a bit of gender dysphoria here and I'm just looking forward to see what I learn and I hope to, you know, share it as I learn. We've learned along the way this month um, uh, of a couple of resources that I'll mention that are not specifically um, LGBTQIA mask resources, but just for visibility of masculine styles in fashion. Uh, you know, we talked to Bruce from Chubster um, a few weeks ago or a couple weeks ago about their 10 year anniversary at Chubster. Uh, and we also featured photographer Spencer Pablo on the webinar. And Spencer is doing a, a visibility project on Instagram called However Chubby. And I just encourage like folks who want to see images of masculine presenting fat people. Um, you know, I think most of the folks he works with identify with the term guy because he uses the term guy a lot. And I know he's respectful of that. Um, but but, you know, if you just are thirsty for that um, uh, visibility, then that's a really great project that that people can be looking at, too. Um, thank you for that question, Julia. Um, another question from the chat. What would your best advice be to fat fashion influencers, bloggers, activists who are new to the scene? Ooh, um, I would say don't get caught up with the numbers. Um, please just make sure that, you know, you have fun with this to begin with. For whatever the reason that you started this, remind yourself, constantly remind yourself of why you started. And every time you get um, distracted or, you know, say bogged down by trolls or interactions with people, just remember that, you know, there is a community out here who is supportive and would love to be here for you. Like I would love to be here for all budding, you know, plus size fashion bloggers and fat activists and um, just to uh, pay it forward as well. 
So yeah, you know, make sure you have fun and just re- constantly remind yourself why you started. There are so many resources out there. So make sure you go out there and you check and you check them out. And um, I, I feel like, you know, in comparison to when I first started, I was like a lost lab. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing. But there's so much out there. So go out there, follow. And don't, don't be shy with asking questions just like you're asking right now. Do you, um, do you think about rebranding your blog now that you are using different pronouns for yourself? Uh, yes, I have thought about it immensely um you know curves become them um i i don't know i don't know how people you know would react to it um so it's still percolating in my mind and also the confusion right uh you know people wanting to reach out to curves become her but instead going okay there's no curves become her anymore so who is it now so there's that confusion so if I am able to make a good transition and somehow lead people towards curves become them I would love that I would I would honestly love that but for now I think I will stick with my original title gotcha um okay I have another question for you from the chat I am, um, this is from Lily. I am a queer fat therapist and sometimes I find it difficult to bring up fat acceptance to other fat clients because Uh. I'm not a registered dietitian and I do not specialize in eating disorder recovery. And yet I find it important to introduce the idea of fat liberation and fat fat acceptance to clients um, who are experiencing fat phobia from others or internalized fat phobia. Sometimes I do get pushback in though from from clients who are still stuck in diet culture i guess my question is this do you think therapists who are not trained in eating disorder treatments are still equipped to handle these sort of issues with fat clients i think as long as um you know you are coming from a person-centered perspective and you're not um you know imposing any dogmas you know, or anything, I think that should be okay as like suggestions or like, you know, points of view. I think that's totally fine. Um, Of course, you know, eating disorder recovery, there's a very, there are very specific recovery processes for everyone. And um, I think you have to take into account, you know, what the person's history is and all that stuff. And you're right, you know, people will not be ready to talk about this because they are not ready to give up diet culture. And so I think you should, you know, discern it, make sure that, you know, with each person that you're speaking with, what the level of comfort is um, when you discuss these things. And if they would like to discuss it further, I don't see any harm in it, to be honest. I think that um, back when I was struggling with eating disorders, you know, I, I would have been really appreciate, I would have really appreciated having someone come from this perspective. So yeah, no harm done, but you know, just make sure, you know, there's a bit of discernment there. One of the things that we know from working with folks in eating disorder community and hearing from folks in fat community is that, you know, fat people are so dramatically underdiagnosed when they have eating disorders. So as a therapist, it's really easy for you to end up with, even if you're not, that's not your area of expertise, it's so easy for you to end up with someone uh, with a fat client who has an eating disorder because no one else ever considered the possibility that they have an eating disorder. Because our perceptions are people with eating disorders are are like deathly thin and if you uh, if you're not that um or you don't look like you were recently that we can't even perceive that you might have an eating disorder yeah yeah that's really challenging i will just also point out um to the audience nafa does have um a document of uh, guidelines for for therapists who are working with fat clients it was developed by um uh barbara Barbara Bruno and uh, Deb Burgard, and who are you know both um, both trained therapists, and it has some great tips. I think that many of you know, but many of your colleagues would not even think about regarding everything from you know make sure you have chairs that fit fat people <laughs> to like to thinking about these you know don't assume fat people have been sexually abused. That's one of the narratives that comes up in therapy a lot. 
is that that's why you got fat, right? To hide and protect yourself, which, you know, may be true originally, but don't assume that. And, you know, some, you know, thoughts about the underdiagnosis of of eating disorder. So check that out. You can find it under, um, I I believe it's under the um, learning tab. There's a section on NAFA website. There's a section for brochures and publications. And there is one specifically for fat therapists that you might find useful folks. And it is, you know, we should say like, not only is this Fat Liberation Month, um, but art is like the trifecta for this month because it's Fat Liberation Month, it's Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, which of course you are not Amer- American, but you are of Asian descent. And then it is also Mental Health Awareness Month. So we're really grateful to have, you know, Artie with, um, with their expertise here to talk about, to talk about that as well. Um, what do you think, um, let's focus on that for a minute. Um, why do you think that mental health discussion around mental health is still so stigmatized and what tips do you have to for people about um, opening up around that? I think it's, um, you know, partly because uh, accessibility can still be difficult. Um, and, um, there's, there's a lot of different cultural contexts as well and religious contexts and um, people get, you know, stuck in that and it's just not as commonly um, discussed. Um, there's a lot of awareness um, online, but I don't feel like there are enough important conversations happening between people who are struggling with mental health disorders, aside from just the expert's point of view. And I feel like, you know, we need to include the uh, voices of the people who have been struggling. And uh, that just isn't there either because, you know, there is a sense of shame. There is a sense of, um, you know, um, looking down on yourself and, you know, looking at mental health as like this uh, failing of some sort. And um, I think, you know, people often forget that, you know, mental health is still a part of your overall health. And just like you would mend your physical health, you would, you know, um, why do why do we not do the same for our mental health? Why do we not think of it that way? And why do we still, um, uh, yeah, stigmatize it in that way? And I feel that, you know, physicians and parents and just a lot of people on the whole, we need um, more mental health toolkits in the curriculum, for example, um, and just to introduce this early on so that you know we can break away from these stigmas. What thoughts do you have about balancing um, pursuit of health, mental or physical health, with, um, with not getting into an area of healthism? Right, yeah. I um so I'm I was diagnosed with um type 2 diabetes um 2 years ago and um you know uh I l- had to learn to make that distinction between not actively partaking in diet culture and reminding myself that these dietary constraints that I have now are um not you know things like calorie counting and calorie deficits and all of that stuff. So I think if you make a really conscious effort, um, you know, despite having, you know, health issues, disabilities and stuff like that, and still manage to nourish yourself, uh, enjoy food in the process, you can still, you can still have a way to get around it without, you know, getting into healthism. I feel like health psychology was just like one of those really triggering subjects for me in uni. And um, it was really interesting uh, later on to combat that with all of the fat acceptance information that I have received and all of the, you know, um, I mean, I don't know much about intuitive eating, um, but, you know, all of the non-diet culture things that have replaced all of these points of view ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, so we probably have time for one or two more questions from the chat if anybody else has questions. And um, in the meantime, what's next for you, Artie? Um, 
Um, well, you know, we are on a semi-lockdown in Singapore, so things are pretty quiet. Um, it wasn't supposed to be a busy week with like photo shoots and stuff like that, but um, I guess I'm hoping to, um, you know, delve back into my writing, to be honest. Um, it's been really fun being on Instagram and it's fun doing TikTok videos, but writing is always where my heart used to be and it still is. And I just feel like I need to return to my writing and just get into it and um, really hash things out. I think it'd be interesting if I could shift a lot of my work to maybe other platforms aside from Instagram. Um, to, you know, avoid the trolls, I guess, you know, to have a place that's uh, more accessible for people without the perils of trolls and stuff like that. So that's just yeah. stuff in the works that I'm considering. And and as you get back into writing, is it, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot with this question, but are we anticipating an arty book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> okay i i will not beg you for details because i don't want to put you on the spot but we will just, we will just all direct positive energy towards an arty book thank you. Coming thank you. <laughs> um are there other projects that you want to highlight or um anything else that you want to make sure that we um it looks like we don't have any more questions from the chat so yeah. is there anything else that you want to make sure you know that that the audience didn't ask you that i didn't ask you but that you think is really important for us to be thinking about this fat liberation month um you know i think that like like the title of my chat here you know um a lot of our lived experiences are intersectional. And I just, you know, uh, we talk about intersectionality a lot, but I'd really like people to, um, you know, comprehend how um, different aspects of your identity can spill over and not just in a negative way, but also in a really positive way. And I uh, just want to remind people that me coming to a good place with my body and you know, learning, discovering fat liberation led me down a place of deeper identity with my gender, with my sexuality, and in general, you know, with my relationships with, with people and just made me more self-assured. And um, I just I just wish that, you know, that is something that people could um, experience for themselves. Mm -hmm. I always say fat liberation is like the gateway in drugs. Right. You know, like yeah, it is. It is. It's, it such really is. it's such a beginning point for for so many other kinds of liberation. If fat if fat liberation is what you discover first, then yeah. it it opens the door to all of these other like you know all of these other wonderful pieces. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Artie. Tell folks again where they can find you. I know it's still curves becomes her at on all the social media, and which yes. ones are you on? um on instagram um twitter uh on tiktok i'm arty olivia so you can find me there um it's very random it's not very activisty um so the bulk of my work is on instagram and my wordpress blog which i will have to update soon <laughs> and which is and your blog is cursebecomeher.com dot wordpress.com got it um and we'll uh, we'll put that in the in the notes for the um, YouTube video, thank and you. um, and just thank you for for being with us today, Artie. Thank you for being part of my um, social media world. I don't even like I don't even remember Instagram without you. you must have been, like, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't remember social media without you, honestly. Yeah, and you know, to be able to have this chat with Nafa, I mean, you know, just the the history of Nafa and everything, it is such a privilege, privilege and such an honor. And you know, I really appreciate all the work. And Fat Liberation Month has been so awesome. Has been yes, so awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, we're going to kind of keep the energy going on through the rest yeah. of the year. Like, we won't be doing this uh, this pace of programming for the rest yeah, of yeah. the year. I promise, Darlene. Um, we won't be doing this pace of programming for the rest of the year. Um, but we do have lots of good things already, um, in, you know, sort of in the works. And in particular, I should mention, you know, in the, in the United States um, and in many places in the world, June is Pride Month. And... Yeah. Um, we're our, our first webinar for Pride Month will be with the uh, the editors of the new Fat and Queer anthology that just came out this week all over the world. So please look up their book and and um, and be ready to sign up for that webinar in early June from us. And um, please, you know, please follow Artie. Keep in keep tabs of what they are doing because it is always fantastic. Um, and I think that's it. We want to thank our. Um, uh, Bill Kiss and Ryan from Pro Bono ASL for interpreting for us today. Um, and thank you to our um, NAFA's Administrative Director, Darlene Howell, for all the behind the scenes work of this webinar. And thank you, audience, for being with us today and for your really great questions. And we will, um, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you.